Hi everyone. So we're going to continue on the discussion on chapter seven. Now that we know how to write chemical equations and balance them, before we can talk about all the different types of reactions that you're going to see, we first need to specifically discuss the AQ state. And the reason for this is because it's a little more complex than the other states, solid, liquid, and gas. AQ in this case means that the substance that you have has been dissolved in water. Now it turns out that when you take something and you mix it with water, they behave differently than when they were by themselves. So let's talk a little bit about some of the terminologies that you need to know in order to understand this better. So water is what we call the solvent, and then the substance we put in is called the solute. There's a lot more of the solvent than there are solutes. So if you mix water with sodium chloride, for example, there's way more water in your mixture compared to the sodium chloride. Now, an aqueous solution is a homogeneous mixture. Homogeneous, remember, means that you can't tell that there's two different things in there. It looks like one. So that's what an aqueous solution is. This picture here gives you an example of a homogeneous solution. On this beaker right here is water, and then the person is adding a little bit of a solute in there. And you can see that there's two different solutes there that's added. In one case, after mixing, it looks like it doesn't have anything in it, even though there is some solute that's been added to that particular water. So that is what we call an aqueous solution because it looks clear. It looks like there's only one thing that's present. The one in the middle is what we refer to as a precipitate because there is some liquid at the top, but there's also some solid here at the bottom. And as a result, it's not homogeneous. There's clearly two different phases in there. When we add things to water, some of them will dissolve, which means that it will form this nice clear solution, and some of them won't. So how do we know which ones will dissolve and which ones won't? We're going to use something called the solubility rules. This is only applicable to ionic compounds. So the solubility rules tells you which of these ionic compounds are going to be soluble, which means that when you mix them with water, they're going to form that homogeneous mixture, and which ones are insoluble, which means that they're going to form two different phases. So the way you use this table is fairly easy. From the top here, it says all group 1A are soluble. So anytime you have a group 1A species in your ionic compound, automatically that ionic compound is going to be soluble. And then as you go down here, you see that if you have sulfite, automatically that's going to be insoluble. However, there's certain exceptions that happen. So for sulfite, it's always going to be insoluble except when the sulfite is combined with group 1A, group 2A, and ammonium ion. So here's a quick example, NaCl. Well, Na is group 1, so that's always soluble. So this is always going to be soluble. If you have MgS, well, according to this rule, S is insoluble, except if the S is combined with one of these guys, group 1A, group 2A, and NH4. Well, Mg is group 2A, so it would be soluble. Now, what about if I have FES? Again, going back to the rule, S2 minus, always insoluble, except if it's one of these guys. Well, FE is not any one of those three guys. So as a result, in this case, we would say this is insoluble. When it's insoluble, we put S next to it because it forms a solid, as you saw earlier in the picture, and as the picture this here shows you as well. So just to reiterate, this one right here is a soluble salt, and this one right here is insoluble, okay? This one right here will be given symbol AQ. This one right here will be given symbol S. That cloudiness that you see inside that beaker is a sign that you have a lot of solid that's not dissolved. So that's how you use that solubility rule. So let's say I'm looking at PBSO4. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look at my rules starting from the top to see if there's either a PB or an SO4 listed. Well, if I look through all of them, I see that there's an SO4 rule listed here, and it says all SO4 are soluble, except one of these guys. PB is one of the exception. PBSO4 is going to be insoluble. So then the symbol for it next to it would be S. 
what we're going to talk about now is a little bit about how things actually look like when they're mixed with water. Now, it turns out that that depends on what kind of compounds we're talking about. So a covalent compound is not going to do the same thing as an ionic compound when they're mixed with water. So let's start talking about a covalent compound first, because that's a little easier to understand. So with a covalent compound, the solid form really just looks like the picture shown right here, which is that a bunch of them are stuck together. So for example, let's say you have table sugar, which is C12H22O11. There's a lot of atoms here, but all of them are connected together by a chemical bond. So I can draw each one of these as, say, a circle. So that circle represents one molecule. So in the solid phase, if I write this as that, C12H22O11 with a solid next to it, what it means is that a bunch of these molecules are stacked together close to each other because they're a solid. Now what happens when you add water to this thing? What water does is it starts pulling each of these molecule apart from the rest of the other molecules. So if I represent my water as blue circles, then what it looks like once you dissolve the sugar is you're going to have sugar and then a bunch of water surrounding the sugar. And so the reason why when you mix something, it looks clear to you. So just like in this case right here, right? I have water, I'm adding some sugar to it. Now all of a sudden it looks all clear. The reason is because all these sugar particles that was originally stuck together is now broken apart into individual particles surrounded by water. And they are too small for us to see by eye. So they just look like a clear solution. Whereas when they're in this form, they're large enough for us to be able to observe. That's how a covalent compound dissolves. And again, this picture right here kind of shows you how the individual sugar particles are now broken apart and surrounded by water molecules. Now, ionic compound behave differently. So if you have NaCl, for example, formed by Na plus and Cl minus, the two different ions. So when I'm looking at NaCl in the solid state, I have to draw one for just the Na black circle. Let's use a red circle for Cl minus. So what it looks like is the following. You have this, then you have this next to it, and you have another one of these, and so on. So they still repeat just like the sugar, except that the repeat here is each ion. So what happens when you add the water? Each of those ions get separated away from the original solid. So it's not NaCl that's being pulled apart, but it's the Na plus and the Cl minus. So what it looks like after you have the addition of water is you have your Na, so I'll just put a positive here, and then you have your Cl, I put a negative there, and each one of them is surrounded by some water molecule, something like that, okay? It doesn't look like this with water around it, okay? But that's actually wrong, right? So it doesn't look like that. It looks like these pictures right here on the top. So each ion is surrounded by a bunch of water particles. So that's important because when we write NaCl dissolve in water, really what we should write is not NaCl aqueous, but it should be Na plus aqueous and then Cl minus aqueous. So now let's talk a little bit about how we know that it looks like this and it doesn't look like that. Well, we do that by experiment. So the experiment that we do is illustrated right here. Take a light bulb and you put the wires of the light bulb in some kind of a solution. And the solution may or may not conduct electricity. So if it conducts electricity, then, it, then you're gonna see that light bulb turns on. If it doesn't, then it would look something like this where the light bulb stays dark. And sometimes it will look like this instead. So it's a little bit of light, but not a lot. We categorize these solutions with the different quantity of light as electrolytes or non-electrolytes. So the one with the most light, we call a strong electrolyte. The one that has medium amount of light, we call a weak electrolyte. And the one that has no light, we call a non-electrolyte. The only way the light bulb can turn on is if the solution contains ion. So the solution must have 
ions for the light bulb to turn on. And so this is the reason why we know that our ionic compounds are broken apart into ions in this solution. Some of the ionic compounds are broken apart into a lot of ions. So those are our soluble ionic compounds. Those are the ones that form strong electrolytes. And then we have our insoluble ionic compounds. So you might think that if it's insoluble, then it's not gonna form any ions at all. Well, it turns out that insoluble means that a little bit of it dissolves. You still form a few ions. Your light bulb is going to be just a little bit of light in the category of the weak electrolytes. Okay, now what about the non-electrolytes? Who belong in that category? Well, the things that belong in that category are things that cannot produce ions. Well, those are covalent compounds because by its nature, covalent compounds don't have ions in them, okay? The strong electrolytes are the ones that produce a lot of ions. Weak electrolytes are the ones that produce a few ions. Right now, we only talk about something called soluble salts, which is the ionic compounds that are shown to be soluble in that solubility rules, right? And then for the weak electrolytes, we only talk about something called insoluble salts, which are basically things that are insoluble based on this table. We haven't talked about these two other categories that are shown here, which are strong acids, strong bases, and later on weak acids and weak bases. We're going to talk about them later, but right now strong electrolytes are the soluble salts, weak electrolytes, insoluble salts, non-electrolytes are the covalent compounds.